it's going to say joint ventures if you have a joint venture you are no longer allowed to proportionately consolidate you will from now on, on onwards equity account for it. why because IFRS is trying to create consistency there are still choices available under IFRS for example investment property you could either be at cost or at fair value but you know what if you compare somebody who's done their financial who has an accounting policy for investment property at cost versus someone at fair value the disclosures are so detailed that it's very very easy for a user to compare so where there are choices that still remain in IFRS it's a very very easy adjustment to get to the other basis but what I'm seeing over time is IFRS is taking away those choices finally trend we're seeing is if you follow IFRS you follow IFRS in its entirety if you're following the standards, if you follow the standards, you follow them all, and then only you state IFRS compliant. If you decide not to follow a certain standard or a group of standards, then you are not in compliance with IFRS. All right, so either adopt or you out. And that's the unfortunate reality here. Now, this is the trends in IFRS. Now, over the recent past, the board, the board of the ISB have been setting a lot of changes. Now, things are not stable. You know, I told you it used to be 300 pages in my day. It went up to 1,000 or 2,000 pages now. I think the book is going to continue growing. Why? Because the agenda keeps on getting more and there are more and more items being put onto the ISB agenda. Why? What's driving these things? One, th one factor that's driving these things is definitely definitely the convergence requirement. The other is a knee-jerk reaction, if I can call it that, out of the financial crisis. So IFRS 9 comes out of financial crisis. However, things like leasing, that was there on the cards for very, very long. IFRS 10, 11, 12 were on the cards for a very, very long time and they're coming in play. Now we as technical people are finding it very, very difficult to keep, in, to keep up to date. I mean, just recently, to yesterday, exposure draft on revenue was, was released. I mean, we're finding it difficult. I really, really sympathize with people in practice. You've got to do your business and at the same time keep up with this whole lot of things. Now, this is what's on the board's agenda. What's effective for us? IFRS is not a stable platform. It really isn't. For 2011, there's a whole lot of things coming into play. For example, IFIC 19 is an interpretation that deals with the extinguishment of liabilities using equity instruments. Management commentary, there's a standard issued. IFRS 1 and 7, there have been various amendments. The annual improvements have been there. IS 32, there was an amendment to the standard which is effective in 2011. IFRIC 14, there's been a change which is effective in 2011. Related parties, there's been a revised related party standard issued in 2008 which is effective in 2011. So this is what's relevant for 2011. Going forward, whoa, there's lots more things coming into play. For 2012, de-recognition disclosures coming into play. Deferred tax for underlying assets coming into play. Other IFRS 1 issues. 2013 is the big year. So if we're thinking that this is going to be a period of, of relaxation, there isn't. 2013, we have IFRS 10, 11, 12, 13 coming into play, IFRIC 20 coming into play, various items coming into play. So IFRS is not stable. Why isn't it stable? I wish it would be stable. Yeah? IFRS 9 would be financial instruments, classification and measurement of assets, financial instruments, classification. Post-2013, it's either going to be, because there's currently talk of deferring it to, two, they're thinking about moving it to 2015. So unfortunately, people, IFRS is not a stable platform. But what it is trying to achieve, ladies and gentlemen, is trying to make reporting more transparent and better. I think if I can maybe share one lesson I've learned from you know, from the standard setters, when meeting with them, I think Bob Garnett, who was a previous board member, s said something very, very important is, you know, when you do transactions, when you structure transactions, you structure transactions for a business objective, never the other way around. 
never structure transactions for an accounting objective. Accounting has to follow the way you've done the transaction, not the other way around. I'm not saying don't be aware of accounting consequences, but don't try to enter into a contract to, for example, avoid the straight lining of lease payments. Don't do that. If the reality of the transaction is to achieve something, do that. If the commercial realities, act on commercial realities rather than look at the accounting first and then do a transaction. But anyway, that, yeah? I think what we're going to do is the next step we're going to look at our most queried issues in our region. I think at this point in time, let's break for Maghrib prayer. Yeah. We'll come back and return. In to 15 Bakhtar. minutes. We'll 15 minutes 15. for Maghrib prayer and then we'll return. Um, welcome back. Let's continue. I think let's, I just want to recap quickly what we said before. What I think or what we need to believe in is that accounting is keeping score and accounting is recording of transactions. That's the reality. Transactions should never be structured for an accounting objective. Unlike tax or unlike other things or legal requirements, accounting should be a thought after looking at the business requirements. We looked at various trends in IFRS. In the region, increased complexity. We said increased com we have increased complexity because business has become complicated. Increased disclosure because regulators want more information. Increased use of fair values. Fair value is generally good. It's just people don't understand it. IFRS is taking away choices and we now have to apply IFRS fully. We then spoke about the agenda. I didn't go into detail of what's in the agenda, but I'm you know, looking at what's on the, the standard setter's plate far too much. And that, well, how does that impact us? There's a lot of IFRS coming our way. I'm going to be discussing some of them with you. Now that brings us on to the linkage to where we're starting now. I mean, I'm in a technical desk. My job, I wake up in the morning to answer questions on IFRS. That's my job. <laughs> and that's a reality, but it's a job I enjoy. Because deep down, I know that I'm trying to achieve transparency. I'm trying to provide credibility to the financial markets. I don't want another Lehman Brothers to happen. These are realities. These things happen. Global financial crises happen. Are they accounting issues? I mean, maybe that's a question you've got to ask. Is that an accounting problem or is it some other issue? I don't think so. I think no matter how strong accounting standards you have, people want to commit fraud or want to mislead public, they will find a way. So yes, IFRS has weaknesses where people can manipulate currently. The objective of IFRS is still to keep things clean. Let me tell you some of the, the war stories. I mean, I've been working in the Gulf for the last five years. I've seen the boom and the, bu I've seen the, boom and the bust. <laughs> I've seen it both. I've seen Dubai before the boom and I've seen it post boom. And the reality or the big thing that faces us there is accounting for investment property. Now, you know the funny thing about clients is they love fair value when prices are going up. But when prices go down, oh this fair value thing is nonsense man. The market is crazy. That's the, that's the things we hear them say. But when the prices of fair, when fair value is going up, no problem. <laughs> Even though it is uh, purely driven by sentiment, people don't have a problem with going prices going up, but when prices go down, then they start questioning fair value. Nobody questioned fair value in 2005 and 6 and 7. But in 2008, Nicholas Sarkozy and Angela Merkel discussed fair value. I mean, that's the reality. I mean, what is fair value? I'm just saying to say it's, it's recording the transaction and the reality of what things were. Investment property was a big issue. People were buying property left, right and center. Speculative property. I mean, in fact, I'll give you some examples. In, uh, we had a client in Bahrain who didn't even buy property. Bahrain is a small island. There is limited amount of land. What did they do? They bought, I can't call it land, they bought things in the middle of the ocean, a right to build something to reclaim the land in future 
to reclaim the land and then 